Welcome to the Artistic Foodies, the show that explores life through the lens of art and food. I'm Abbas Muhammad. And I'm Irfan Raidon. And today we're talking with Zarka Nawaz, TV and film producer, published author, and journalist. Zarka Nawaz is a writer and filmmaker who created Little Mosque on the Prairie, premiering on the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Channel, in 2007. It ran for six seasons and was watched in over 60 countries and landed in the was in the public eye. Her memoir, Laughing All the Way to the Mosque, was published in 2014. Her new novel, Jamila Green Ruins Everything, was published in March 2022. And her latest TV comedy show, titled Zarka, premiered in Canada in May 2022. The show explores a fictional 50-year-old divorcee and her hilarious plan to get back at her ex-husband. had your show out uh little mosque on the prairie for a while you've got your new show coming up which looks hilarious i'm very excited for that um and so we want to talk a little bit about that and then i want to take it another level deeper um as well and get a little bit of philosophical with you um and talk about you know the muslim narrative and talk about truth telling as well those are things that are of great interest to me especially as we're seeing a lot more muslims coming up you know uh um telling their truths as it be right so that's just the general context before we dive into the questions um i just wanted to see if you had any questions for us no i mean those are good questions i just have to tell you i'm not a philosopher or a very deep thinker (laughs) (laughs) i'm just a comedy writer and you know so you won't get a lot of deep answers from me. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about um, how you kind of got into this field of writing, you know, specifically for TV and, um, you know, how, how that how that came about? I was, you know, a typical child of immigrants. My parents wanted me to be a doctor. And I, you know, I, too, drank the Kool-Aid and went to university, um, University of Toronto. And did a four-year science degree <laughs> and did apply to medical school at least once, I'm pretty sure, wrote the MCAT. But I think the feeling, the desperation to get in started to wane <laughs> around second year when I was like, oh my God, this will require me to specialize in subjects that I have not one iota of interest in, <laughs> like physics and organic chemistry. And there's no way I'm going to summon the enthusiasm to get A's in these subjects, like physics particularly, even if I could summon the enthusiasm, there's no way I can summon the brain power <laughs> to to get like 90s because I just don't have it in me, like calculus. Like I like I don't have the academic acumen in me to, to, to get the 90s that are going to be required for these subjects. Um, and I no longer have the desire to want to do it anymore. And, and I, and I was getting, and strangely enough, I should have seen the writing on the wall, you would think, right. But you had to take arts courses and those were always like, people got scared of the arts courses because they're like, oh no, those are English and philosophy and people may not do as well in those. You can, you know, but I actually was getting A's in the arts courses and getting D's and C's in the, you know, in the science stuff. And you would think that it would register that perhaps my talents were lying elsewhere. So around the fourth year, I think it was the third year when I was like, oh my God, I can't do it anymore. But I was like, but I've invested already so many years in this degree. If I bail now, I'll never have evidence of a degree. It'll just be like this torturous year. So I was like, okay, you know what? You just got to suck it up and get the degree. Um, even if you don't get into medical school, which I was pretty sure I wasn't going to get into because there are standards and boards that monitor people like me to make sure the general public is protected. And sure enough, <clears throat> I did not get in, um, but I had the degree. So you got the degree. I, thought, I got the damn degree. And I was like, now what am I going to do with a BSc of which I have no desire to pursue a career in of anything related to it in any way? 
And so a friend of mine was always talking about that forbidden career, right? And those days in like in the, you know, the 1990s, there weren't Muslims in journalism or filmmaking. I mean, it was just not known. Like, there were no role models. And so I had really kind of like this path that had, had not really been trodden with a lot of people. But she was always talking about, you know, my best friend Rahat was always talking about being a novelist and going into film and God, that was so exotic, right? Those were the exotic careers that conservative Muslim women who came from backgrounds like me from strict Punjabi households, <laughs> very strict and like crazy strict Punjabi parents would, wouldn't even dream of. Uh, but I had two things going for me, failure <laughs> and being a woman because my, my father was one of those dads who, um, I was his only daughter. He had two younger sons and he had become obsessed after the partition about female emancipation and education in his weird Punjabi patriarchal way. Right. You know, cause he had no problems with my mother staying home and cooking fresh rotis every single day for him. That did not face him at all. Cause he puts the wife in a different category than the daughter. That's what I realized. Right. And for him, the daughter was a different being. Um, and he had seen his female relatives back home, you know, because he had left to, to like a lot of firstborn males to make money. He was an engineer to send money home to save the family from imminent doom and disaster because of the partition. They had, to, you know, they were in India. They were they had been forced refugees out, lost all their money and holdings and were scrambling to survive. And so like a lot of, you know, firstborn sons, they had left to make money and send it back home for the sake of survival. And when he came back home after years of visiting, he saw all his female relatives have been married off very young. And he had known them as very intelligent women with agency. And then he had seen their life, you know, the potential of their academic futures cut short because of babies and marriage. And so we got it into his head that the worst thing that can happen to a woman is marriage oh, wow. <laughs> and babies worst thing, right? You don't want that to happen. So he, he decided to raise me with this ethic that if you could make money and become financially independent, you would never need a man. You would never need to get married. And thus there would be no need for those babies, <laughs> right? Cause there's nothing good ever came from that. So I was literally raised with this weird prototype Punjabi feminist father, um, and it like it was always that marriage is failure, marriage is failure, marriage is failure. The only good thing that you can in a woman's life is career, career, career. And so it gets into you and it, affect, it affects you psychologically. Right. And so that's what happened to me that when I didn't get into medical school, I was like, oh, no, like there was no plan B. Like there was only one plan that was to become a doctor, get really rich and be incredibly successful in my career. Like it was from the point, from the moment I could like, what I was conceived, that was the only direction that was given to me. And so I was just like, when I didn't get into medical school, I was like, I, I don't know. Like I literally lost focus. I didn't know what to do with my life. I was like, I, no one had ever suggested to me that this wasn't going to happen, that this wasn't the path that was going to work out for me. So I was like, it was like catastrophe. I didn't know what to do. But luckily for me, my mom, who had never viewed marriage and <laughs> marriage and babies as a catastrophic failure in her life, saw this opportunity. And she's like, oh, this is good. Now that we, you know, my father's licking his wounds. He's not sure what's going on. I'm confused. She swooped in and goes, now let's find some boys for you to get married. And then we can settle this finally, right? And I was like, what? And suddenly all these men, they just start magically appearing. And when you grow up in a very conservative environment where you're not even allowed to talk to boys, like no boy interaction, and suddenly you fully grown men appear at dinner and you're like, what is this? <laughs> it's like a, it's like a shock to your system. Right. And you're, my mom's like, pick one. And I'm like, what? Pick one for what? And I'm like, I don't want to pick one. I'm not ready for this. Like I'm not prepared for it psychologically for this. And so I was like, I got to do something fast because I'm going to wind up. And some of these guys, my mom found this rich vein of Pakistani PhD students who had come to America to study, who needed a wife with benefits, like citizenship benefits, right? 
<laughs> and of course, they had signed some documents from their universities in Pakistan who were not allowed to let their PhDs, you know, disappear into North America, who had signed contracts saying, once you get your PhD, you got to come back and serve, you know, Pakistan for several years. And so they would be like, okay, so we'll get married and then we'll go live in Karachi. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> It's like, what, what is happening? I, I'm not ready to become a housewife in Karachi just because I didn't get into medical school doesn't mean that's my other option suddenly. <laughs> so I, I realized, okay, you got to pull it together fast or, or you know, this is what, what's going to wind up happening. So I pulled it together and pulled myself up and said, okay, you know, you need a second career rapidly or you're going to wind up, you know, in Islamabad <laughs> making rotis for who knows how long. <laughs> So it was just a thing that I needed to smarten up. And I applied to journalism school. The deadline hadn't passed to get in. And I applied. And and I, then I got an interview, which is really strange because it was one of the most competitive journalism programs in the country. And you obviously needed a resume and clippings. And you had to prove that you had prepared yourself for life as a journalist. I had like nothing, <laughs> nothing. But the guy said to me, um, you know, you are our only applicant with a science degree. Everybody else has a BA. And I thought, okay, this is my chance. And I said, yeah, because this is the most competitive, you know, journalism program in the country. And I knew everybody was going to apply with a BA. So I decided to get a science degree instead. (laughs) (laughs) That was your plan all along. (laughs) Oh, he believed me, you guys. He believed me. And he goes, wow, to have the (laughs) foresight four years ago. I go, I know. And that's when I knew that I could tell (laughs) stories. that I had a gift and I needed to milk it. And it got me in to journalism school and I blossomed and prospered there. And But even then I realized there was something missing, that journalism wasn't quite the thing that I wanted to do because I was telling other people's stories. I was interviewing mm. and telling other people's stories. And it didn't satisfy this deep, deep need inside of my psyche to tell story. And it's hard to explain, but as a storyteller, like it's one of those things that you have to do or you will die not doing it. And I was one of those people that needed to tell story. And I realized, oh my God, I did a science degree. I went to journalism, I did a journalism degree. I had two degrees. And really I needed to have gone into filmmaking um, or novel writing, but I was now going to go to a third degree. It was just too much. So a friend of mine said, you need to take a course um, at the Ontario College of Art. And it's just three weeks, it's just a summer course. And you make a short film and you'll find out if you have what it takes to be a filmmaker and a storyteller. And so we were put in groups, I think, of five, and one of the five got to be the director and writer, and the other people in the group were the crew, the camera crew. And when it came to my turn to make a short five-minute film, I thought, what could I make it about? And that was when the Oklahoma bombing happened, and I think it was 1995, and in the Toronto International, the Toronto Star, they had all these pictures of Muslim suspects across the front cover. And I think the next day or two days later, Timothy McVeigh was arrested. And I thought, wow, like you could go from Muslim to white guy in like like 24 hours. What does this mean about how much suspicion we have of the Muslim community? And so I thought, wouldn't that be an interesting topic to explore? And so I wrote a film called Barbecue Muslims where two Muslims are barbecuing in their backyard and while they sleep it it blows up and they're immediately accused of being terrorists and it turns out that the real terrorists are an anti-barbecue resistant front who are destroying barbecues because of global warming (laughs) (laughs) of carbon dioxide poisoning in the air and they didn't know that they were blowing up a muslim owned barbecue and because of that Nobody was paying attention to their cause. They were more concerned with that they were Muslims and clearly trying to destroy the West and needed to be arrested. And but they're like, yeah, but we <laughs> we've never even been to the Middle East, right? We we have nothing to do. Like we didn't blow up a barbecue, and it just showed like how everyone turned against them. And I didn't even know at the time it was a comedy, but everyone who was part of making it. The actors, they were hamming it up, right, you know, and adding their own dialogue. And when it screened at the Toronto International Film Festival, everyone was laughing. And that's when I realized that I could take what was political 
and combine it with comedy and make mm. satires about issues that what year was that that you made your short film 19 it aired in 1996 and i think that i turned it into um a digital copy so if you go on my website you can see it it's a terrible film. Like I got to tell you, like it's a you could tell that it's like a student film. And even the Toronto International Film Festival is like, dude, you know, there are people who are gonna be like, we got rejected. <laughs> our film, our technically perfect film, got rejected. We got in oh, with this is the best schlocky film, but they're like, we have to admit, there's nobody out there who's making comedies about the subjects. And in 1996, like a comedy about terrorism, and Muslims. <laughs> And so it got in and it sort of launched my career. And from then I realized that I had this ability to tell story and comedy about political issues that were in the zeitgeist, but make them in such a way that people could watch them and laugh and consume them. And from there I started making more and more shorts. And then I made the documentary Me in the Mosque about patriarchy in the Muslim community when it came to mosque culture. And from there that inspired the show Little Mosque on the Prairie. And that, so that is a sort of a quick 15 minute version of how I became a television oh, very, writer. Very cool. Very cool. I think I, I remember the barbecue mosque or sorry, the barbecue Muslim. Uh, I remember seeing that a long time ago. So you were definitely a visionary. You came up with environmental terrorists before, before there was <laughs> environmental. environmental terrorists. Yeah. So that was good, great, great <laughs> stuff. <laughs> We're environmental terrorists. That's very good. I have to. <laughs> so I know you're from uh, Toronto. Um, I'm f- actually from the Bay Area, but my wife is from uh, Toronto and her family is from Mississauga, a.k.a. Little Lahore, as every single Pakistani person is probably related to somebody who lives, lives in Mississauga. Uh, can you tell us a little bit? about the differences in Canadian media versus U.S. media. I know it's kind of a big subject, but really briefly, like I, I know you have tried to, like I remember reading in the that you tried to get your show in the U.S. market. And I think now it's now it is available right on on Amazon. But I think previously you had a hard time getting it into the U.S. So tell us a little bit about the differences between Canadian media and the U.S. media. The reason Little Mosque on the Prairie got made in Canada was because it was a production by the CBC. The CBC is government um, owned and funded by taxpayers. I think the equivalent for you guys would be NPR. And it was the mandate of the CBC to make sure it represented the regions of Canada and the different um, ethnicities and diversities that exist in the country. So when I pitched this, they were like, oh, She's from Saskatchewan, which is above North Dakota. So I grew up in Toronto, but I live in Saskatchewan. It's an underrepresented province in terms of media, television shows. And she's Muslim, and there's never been a Muslim television show before. So it could have, you know, fit all the criteria. No one expected it to be a hit. In fact, in that time period, Canada wasn't known for sitcoms. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with like Beachcombers and The King of Kensington. I mean, CBC might have made shows, but nobody really had heard of them, and they really hadn't hit national. They hadn't gotten national attention before. And so there was a sense in Canada that we just didn't know how to make sitcoms, and it would elude us. And so. I don't think CBC really was expecting anything to come out of it. Um, But what quickly became apparent was that the Americans were starting to pay attention. (laughs) And in 2000, and we were coming off in 2005, the Danish cartoon controversy had consumed the media. So then suddenly when news started to hit that Canada was making a television series about Muslims and it was going to be a comedy and it was going to be about Muslims in a mosque, which meant a comedy about you know, and their ver- version of Islam, they were convinced that like the whole Danish controversy would, you know, that would be, that would pale in comparison to what was going to happen to Canada. Muslims would like blow up the city and cars would be flipped and there would be mass riots. So literally the world was waiting for like the riots to happen. And thus all the media descended upon us. And they were like little, you know, Canada, this little tiny production. And, and the <laughs> CBC was like, what is happening? <laughs> Like nobody ever paid attention to a, a show in Canada before. In fact, that one of the reasons we couldn't get it, the national attention in those days was because we didn't have the millions and millions of ad dollars that the U.S. has for their shows. So they dominate us in Canadian television and can't watch American shows. They don't watch Canadian shows because they can't find them or a hair of them. And there's no ads for them in the same way that there are ads for 
American television. That's the way it was in the cable days. But suddenly, you know, the New York Times and Al Jazeera <laughs> and CNN, and it was like, what? Everyone was like, why? What is happening? And the Canadian media started paying attention. So what it did it was it gave us the attention we needed so that we, when we aired, it was record-breaking. The CBC hadn't had ratings like wow. that in 20 years. And it just blew open the and then suddenly CBUC was like we have a we have a hit wow. <laughs> which was nuts I mean can you imagine they green light a show in the prairies I, probably they weren't expecting it to survive development much less the pilot and it blows up and so you know, the order was like six, up, six episodes so then suddenly wow. it's like 20 episodes right and then it gets very invasive and hands on and it was supposed to be shot in Saskatchewan they're like hell no we're shooting <laughs> it in Toronto <laughs> they, they were, the only person living here is her <laughs> why, 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 who cares <laughs> I had four babies. Like my children were like, like grade one, three, five, and seven. Like you know, and I was like, like looking at my husband and going, what? like I have to leave because this was like six months of production, and he and he was like, he's like, listen. <laughs> seven white guys in a room are not going to be able to make a show about Muslims in a mosque. Like you have written a show that's so specific to your experience that no one yeah. can do it without you. And if you don't do it, it's not going to get made and the Muslim community needs this. So we're going to have to make our family work. And so he started working part-time and taking care of these four very traumatized children who just lost <laughs> their mommy, right? Like literally overnight, m- m- their mother disappears, right? And my daughters, thank God, were older, like nine and 11. So they were like, okay. But the boys were like seven, five and seven who are not, oh not okay with this. <laughs> and we're really traumatized. To this day, they're in their 20s. They're adult men. And they still talk about those days. Like, like it was like, you know, I mean, it's hard to talk. They tell they tell you, you know, as a woman, you can have everything, but it does come at a cost. And it and, you know, my husband did his best to be a hands on parent. And I was lucky to live in Saskatchewan where we had to depend on the communities, the school, our neighbors, the friends of, you know, the children, their parents to help him. You know, four kids yeah. is a lot of kids <laughs> to drive them around and to do birthday parties and to, you know. But I remember my little guy who had just started grade one and he was very sensitive and anxious and he would suddenly burst into tears in grade one and just like burst into tears. And the, and the teacher saying to the other kids like, OK, he's going through a lot right now. His mom <laughs> She disappeared. <laughs> She skipped town. <laughs> oh, I thank God they didn't tell me at the time. I think I would have died. Like I, they had, they had to shield me from a lot of this knowledge because I was all going through, going through my own trauma as this lone Muslim on the show had never been done before, and you know it was hard. And then you know, and so they had kept these stories from me. How much the kids were like upset. And but, it, you know, it was what it uh, was and I had to do it. And I was, you know, and, and this was before the era of diversity and own voices and, you know, all, me too. And like it was just like this white man in a room going, mm-hmm. who the hell is she and why did she get the show? And so a lot of resentment. And how do we put her in her place? And how do we how do we box her? And I was had no power because I had never been in a writing room. I had never written for television. And so there was a lot of trauma and power, power dynamics and polit- politics of the network and the other writers in the room were all men. You know, a lot of sexism and, you know, aggression and harassment in the room. So it was like, like oh, just like I was like shattered every weekend. I would come home just like shattered. And my husband would have to like gear me up and go, listen, you, you know, you're going to be OK. Everything will be OK. Like the family's fine <laughs> they're fine don't listen to them you're gonna be fine and he would have to like calm me down and give me strength and literally pick me up back on that plane and because it was like a three-hour journey so i'd come home every sunday you know sunday i would come home sunday yeah sunday i'd come home that night since that saturday wait friday i'd come home spend saturday with my family sunday night i would fly back to start on Monday and it was it would go on for six months and it was like the hardest thing I had done in my whole life I mean as a Muslim like it forced me to like you know like cement my relationship with God because you was just like me and God alone right and I'm like what are you doing <laughs> right like I don't like I didn't sign up for this <laughs> so like it was good that I didn't know how hard and how traumatic and how painful mm. it was going to be because it was like I remember waking up that, that was when I learned to pray to Hajjit because I couldn't sleep anyway because I was just like my mind was like I can't sleep this is too much and so I'd wake up and pray to Hajjit every night going I need help I need help I need help this is too much I can't do it 
and just trying to gain strength from prayer mm. and um and that kind of cemented my relationship with god because it was like you've put me into this now you got to help me get <laughs> get help me through this because i can't do this this is mm. too hard and you know sort of just reading the quran and, and saying you know just like reading the verses in the quran like god will not give you more than you can handle i'm like this is more <laughs> than i can handle <laughs> so, and just trusting god and knowing that the help would come and I wouldn't be abandoned. And then just recognizing when the help did come because it was so overwhelming and so difficult. And, and you know, my husband gave me the best advice which is like the, the politics of the show were so intense because everybody wanted to be the person who was going to make the most money and the most recognition from it. And once they realized that, you know, the, the Muslims weren't going to blow up anything, it was kind of like, let's move her out of the way and let's like, you know, let's us get the attention and, and, and everyone was vying for that. And so the, the advice my husband just said, okay, the best thing you can get out of this is to learn to write because it's very rare to get the experience in a writing room and to know how to structure story. And, and in those days, it was like 20 episodes a season. Wow. And that's really hard to do. And especially for the first couple of seasons, the white people had no ideas because they didn't know anything. They didn't live in this world. So the, mm. all those stories had to come out of my head and my experience. So I learned rapidly how to take issues and experiences um, out of my head and my life and how to transform that into story and how to break down story and how to solve story problems. Because it became apparent quickly that the network didn't have much faith in me as a storyteller. Like, you know, it was a white man who was in charge and they had put another white man in charge. But none of them actually knew what they were doing when it came to the storytelling in the Muslim environment. So I had that advantage. Even though they didn't give me the power, mm. I had power because they didn't know how to tell those stories. So I used that power in a way that didn't, like... Um, upset them because you had to be aware of the fact that they had made sure that they had taken mm. power away from me in the fact that, you know, that they kind of, you know, had meetings that could be separate from me, um, but they had to depend on me. And so, you know, they would limit the number of scripts that I could write, but at the same time, all the other writers were depending on me. So then I would just write down the outlines and say, these are how, this is the outline. And so I remember one time the showrunner would come up to me and he goes, you know that I will be um, not giving you credit for this episode and you won't get paid for it. And I was like, that's fine. That's fine. You know, but I was going to, but I write, I remember writing the whole outline for that Christmas episode and handing it to the white writers and they just fleshed it out with dialogue. But to me, what was more important than anything was that I now knew how to outline, to break a story, outline a story and hand it over to writers who would then write the dialogue wow. because they didn't know how to do, it's not that they didn't know how to do that, but they didn't have the knowledge of the story. And so I learned that year after year after year to empower myself with the skill. Cause it's easy to say, Oh, I'm the showrunner, but you need years and years and years of training in the trenches to understand story, um, to solve story problems and to break it down. So that the day inshallah would come when I could be the showrunner mm -hmm. of my own show, but I would know how to do it. And I could lead a story team with knowledge and experience as opposed to just being arrogant and say, Oh, I created the show and now I'm the showrunner because those shows ultimately fail or do very badly in their first season because it's chaos because you know someone at the helm doesn't have the training and the experience so i used the, all of that and what was the great thing about this show was that in the end all the pain and agony that i was going through was that when the show finished everyone thought that i was the showrunner and that i was responsible for all of it and it stayed with me that somehow god would structure things that that in the end all those people that had caused me so much pain and so much anguish like 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 a friend of mine said, stop complaining about that stuff, dude, because in the end, they're gone. And I don't know where they are, but it's your name and it's your who you are that st stays with it. And when people ask mm -hmm. questions, they're asking you. They're not asking them. And that I feel like that's what God did for me in the end was that I had learned how to be patient and I had learned to be dependent on on the creator and I had learned to trust and, and just be, and I was scared and really, you know, really frightened in those years, but I just hung on to that faith that it would be okay mm. and that God would take care of me. Exactly those things happened because you're interviewing me, right? You're not interviewing the myriad of people 
whose names are right. on that credit list. I don't know any of their names. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you bring up, uh, before we switch, switch gears, you bring up a good point, uh, which, you know, I work with a lot of uh, young people in my different uh, uh, projects sometimes. Um, and, um, you know, especially young artists. And a lot of times, uh, you know, nowadays, everybody's all about money and they want to get paid and all that. But, and of course, you should get paid for your work. But at the same time, experience is very, very valuable. So, like, is this something that you would recommend to young people, young artists, young writers who are just starting out, if they have a chance to join a TV program or a, you know, a, a, a film project and they have an opportunity to do work and get the experience that you normally would not get a chance to do, isn't that more valuable than, you know, trying to get paid a lot, you know, uh, up front? And rather you well, can. Well, first of all, I'm going to pay you up front. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> pay the, you know, right while you're doing the work at the time. I think you need experience writing. I think you need to spend your time in the trenches. For me, it was writing a bunch of short form films, taking a lot of courses, being in a lot of um, classes, and then and then ultimately the training came through being in the writing room and learning. You need to do that. Um, you can't you can't hit the ground running. You. Uh, because it's not possible. You need the training. It's like plumbing. You can't be a plumber. You can't just say, I'm a plumber. And they start plumbing. You can't, you need, you need, it's, writing is an internship. Um, it's like a trade and you need to go into those trenches and learn the, and learn the basics of writing. Um, there's no shortcut to it. You just have to do it. So the smart thing is to write a spec script. If you want to be a television writer, then write an original spec script. That's get an agent. Um, Keep writing those scripts until they get really good. Get an agent, get staffed in a writing room, learn the mechanics of a writing room, how it works, and work your way up. And that's typically how Hollywood works. Like they, they, writers who have put in their time in a writing room then get to create their next series. Mm. Jump into creating, like no one's going to take you seriously because how can they? You haven't put in the time. Um, the only people who get to do that are like white men <laughs> and some white women. And that's mm -hmm. because of systemic, you know, the, the structure of uh, systemically has allowed them to have those po um, positions of leadership when they don't deserve them or have earned them. But you want to earn it because if you do earn it, you become a better writer and then you become you're in a position of a show that's actually but people are going to watch. There's too much competition out there for mediocrity. It dies quickly. And it, and it won't survive. And, and quite, quite frankly, won't be given a chance, to be honest with you. Greens and Grills in Union City, California, serves authentic Mediterranean food. Their specialties include North African as well as Middle Eastern favorites, such as merguez, Algerian sausage, shawarma plates, French-style crepes, and American favorites like Eggs Benedict, burgers, and steak. Greens and Grills is halal certified and serves only Zabiha halal and slaughtered meats. Check them out online at greensandgrills.com or call 510-431-3021. So you talk about um, you talk about being pretty much alone in a lot of the experiences where there was no one like you doing what you were doing, where you were doing it. And you, you've given us um, a great and insightful look into behind the scenes of what went into the show. And I want to ask you about um, what was on the screen itself. So, you know, this was at a time where there weren't a lot of Muslim shows. There weren't a lot of Muslims in shows, uh, um, let alone Muslims depicting their own truths on the show. So at this time, you know, and, and actually this question is sort of two parts. The part one is at this time when you were first creating it versus now when you're creating your own show, how does it feel to represent an entire identity 
on the screen because you're I know you're telling you're telling stories about yourself, but a lot of people who are seeing it, they're not seeing, oh, this is Zarqa's story. They're seeing, oh, this is a Muslim story. So how does it feel to represent an entire identity? Is it a responsibility, a duty, a privilege? What kinds of things come it's up? It's interesting, like I was mentioning at the beginning, because I'm not a philosopher. I'm a storyteller. And for me, I can only really represent myself and my own experiences. I can't represent other mm-hmm. people's experiences. And I've had people tell me this is not my mosque going experience. Or I'm not a mosque going Muslim. And that's fine. So my attitude is we are not a monolith. We're a really big community. And everybody has to tell their own truths and tell their own experiences. One person can't do it. So we need more mm-hmm. people like, you know, you have Rami, you have um, Citizen Khan. I forget the creator's name. It just escapes me now. You have Lady Parts. You know, you have so many Muslims, you know, American, Americanish tiger hunter like you have so there's so many feature films now and, and that I'm getting more each each of those tells a different part of the Muslim experience and um, in Canada we have a, sh- a show that just started um, called sort of on CBC gem about a gender fluid Muslim mm-hmm. and that's the first I've seen oh really I gotta and, check and this he's out Muslim and, and that's that is their experience and Everybody, and so what I say is that everyone has to make a show about that's authentic to themselves and their slice of the Muslim pie, right? And what we unfortunately up to, you know, we've only seen this like tiny slice of the Muslim experience. And it's always like the immigrant first, second generation experience. And um, so, you know, I did my mosque experience, but my next show is about the divorce experience because I've never seen a, mm-hmm. a middle-aged Muslim woman in her 50s being divorced and struggling with jealousy <laughs> and revenge, right? When she feels devalued as a woman. I mean, that's mm-hmm. an ex- that's, that's a whole world that I've never seen on television before. I'm not interested now in exploring the first, the conflict between first and second generation and, you know, wearing hijab right. and what will my mom say or what will, you know, like the refugee. I, I, that, those stories I think have been, have been told a lot and they, and they're valuable stories, but they can't be at expense of the rest of it. Right. Yeah. Those have become, um, narratives they've, they've become almost tropes that they've, they've become sort of like this template of oh this is what the experience is like and so now you're stepping into something that's a lot more personal and a lot of i mean it comes to mind when islamophobia was happening a lot of times there were people who would be uh, almost apologists like look like muslims can be doctors and engineers and we like ice cream and we're human just like you um and that built this counter narrative of the good model minority good muslim versus the terrorist Muslim. And so it seems like we're living in an age now, especially more recently with all the the TV shows that you mentioned, where we're stepping out of that and saying, hey, my name is Rami. This is Rami's experience, I'm going to tell you. Not a narrative. I'm not going to speak on behalf of, you know. So I'm just curious to know if you feel that spotlight, if you feel people looking at you thinking, oh, this person is representing Muslims in Islam, or do you feel more liberated to just tell your own personal story? What is that? What is that? I mean, the the push and pull of that feel like. Yeah, I mean, I'm not divorced. I should just tell you guys now. My husband would like everyone to know he never left me for a yoga (laughs) my age. Um, It's a matter of on the record now. Um, so people can stop sending me emails and texts about how how you know sorry they are I'm good I'm good <laughs> um, but I wanted to tell the story because we just never have these stories told about Muslims in a comedic way right and there's a whole world of experience that we don't hear about and I don't and for me I don't I don't sit there and go okay now what experience have Muslims not heard about you know like I don't think that way I just think this is so funny. Mm-hmm. I think of concepts and I think of ideas and I think, oh my God, that's such a funny idea. A Muslim woman, <laughs> like it came to me, this idea actually came to me when I was reading reviews of um, the big sick. <laughs> have you guys, have you guys seen that movie? The Kamel Najiani movie? Yeah. I didn't even watch the movie. I was just reading these out, out <laughs> think pieces by Muslim women. Did you read the think pieces? These Muslim women were so angry. And I was like, what is going on? What is going on? And I was reading these and they're like, like, how dare he make like the brown man with the white trophy wife and, and all of the brown women mm-hmm. are like, he goes through us like we're idiots and we're sidekicks and, and then, you know, pushed aside. And then the woman, the white woman, the trophy. And I was, I was reading all mm-hmm. these outraged women. And I, of course, this is what usually happens in my brain. I thought, oh, that's so funny. <laughs> I thought to myself, if that's the case in Hollywood at that time period, 
that the brown, if there's going to be mm-hmm. a romantic comedy and there's a brown man, the lead has to be a white woman. And I acknowledge that it was based on his true story, yeah. but women felt that, that even within that story, um, br- brown women were thrown <laughs> under the bus. But what what struck me was that that the white trophy that that the woman the the romantic partner has to be white because that's the trophy and and the ideal of the romantic partner. So I. Thought, Okay. Like I made it. Yeah, I made it. I got the white woman. So I thought, oh my God. Then then, then let's do a comedy about how a brown woman says, oh yeah, that's your trophy. Then I'm going to get me a white trophy too. And we're going to go white trophy to white trophy. And I was thinking, well, what could compete against a white yoga instructor half a woman's age? Because such a clean I go, well, for men, you know, stereotypically it's youth and beauty and age and skinny and all that stuff. But for a woman, then Mm -hmm. if we're going to go with stereotypes and tropes, it would be rich, doctor, prestigious. What would be the highest echelon in the medical profession, which is the brain surgeon, right? So, <laughs> go I go, all the way to the top. the top and then let's make the husband a podiatrist like a foot doctor right <laughs> so <laughs> so in this show he's a podiatrist who had always wanted to be a brain surgeon she decides she decides to find the white trophy so she could compete, compete your father's getting remarried oh no Siri, find me the number one dating app for people over 50. Mama, just relax. I'm coming down. White people only. How fast did dating apps work? Why? What did you do? I told everybody on the internet that I'm coming to the wedding with Brian. Brian? Oh my God. Mama, just delete. Delete your comments. (gasps) Just upload parameters and photo. This is not a competition. It is if I win. (sighs) Right. So that's how I that's what inspired this series was. I thought it would be so funny to have a to have a bitter, vindictive Muslim woman who decides to go after her husband with her own white trophy and goes and finds Brian, the brain surgeon. So it was based on the think pieces based on that movie because it just it just triggered this um, hilarious notion of what. Okay, let's do this. Let's take it all the way. Then, if this is true, then let's let's take instead instead of complaining about it, let's let's send it up. <laughs> so that was actually why I was divorced was because I wanted to um, talk about that. <laughs> And it's really it's really interesting that you bring up the especially this white trope of like this white trophy spouse, because, um, you know, I was talking about like personal truths versus narratives. You know, there is a narrative of the of the brown immigrant that scores the white wife and is like American dream. But also there's a little bit of personal truth in there because Kamel Nanjiani is actually married to a white woman. And that movie is based on his personal life. Right. So some people might not get that. They might think, oh, this is just a rehashing of the same trope. And there was another film, I think it was 2019, called Hala, where this teenage uh, Pakistani girl falls in love with this white skater boy, cool boy, you know. And so, you know, that sort of like brings up these questions of the white gaze. Who is your audience? Are you writing for an audience? And, uh, you know, when you're writing, especially with the new show, are you writing for an audience? Are you writing for yourself? Is your audience Muslims? Are they non-Muslims? What? Who's the? Who do you see in the in the in the yeah, audience? I don't have when an audience. I just write. I just find the funniest concept I can find, and I write for myself and what makes me laugh. <laughs> I write. It, I'm the audience, um, and then I pick writers that I like working with who are funny, and then we all kind of come together and go, "Oh my God, wouldn't it be so funny that she just wants him for the? <laughs> she just wants him for the revenge, just for that one day." But he actually wants a proper relationship, and and she's so crazy that she already tells people that she's going out with him before he even exists. And then she finds him, and but he wants a relationship, and he can blackmail her to do what he wants now, which is like go on all these white dates. Which like, and then I thought, the, what is the whitest of all white dates? Right, birding. So <laughs> to go. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And, and he's like, well, and of course it's too late, right? Because I've already told everyone. So I just had this funny notion that. And we shot this scene, and of course, we have great weather now, great weather before, but the day we shot it, it's raining, it's minus four, it was so cold and miserable, and so it played perfectly, because I'm just like shivering, going, oh, this is it. 
for it like we had it's been four hours just like right <laughs> like like my life is becoming a series of nightmares because of this one mistake that i made and he's like i want to go to the mosque i'm like no that's where date's gonna die and then of course i meet oh i meet the God. imam who i had a thing for back in the day <laughs> My friend Saudi wrote the hilarious <laughs> line where you know the the imam who I'm like oh, and he like he's finally single. <laughs> he's finally single. This wife died by choking on a chili pepper, and then I'm like, what? and we, oh my god, I had always wanted to marry him, but except now this stupid white albatross is <laughs> our. And so we had this funny scene where the imam is like telling me how his wife died, and I'm like, and then this white guy goes, oh, I'm sorry for your loss. And the imam's like, who's who's this? And I go, he's, he's my wife, right? <laughs> and the guy's like, I'm her boyfriend. And I'm like, ah, right in the mosque. And the mosque. Oh and the my host, God. You know, she's a boy and a friend. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's this comedy of this like like it, like my life because of this one mistake is spiraling now out of control <laughs> and, and so i just thought like to me that's like i love making shows about really flawed impulsive women because i am one of those who makes mistake after mistake after mistake <laughs> it's, it's no more, more complicated than the, you know the mom sees me with a white man in the mosque and the mom and, I, and it's just getting worse and worse so to me that's i i love making comedies that where people things that make me laugh and that i would want to watch um mm-hmm. and i just like i want to make the funniest most entertaining show and i also want to make shows that that like at the core of my being like like I'm a practicing Muslim and my, as I mentioned, my relationship with God really cemented during those little mosque years. And so I, I, so my, my prayer is always like, I want to serve, you know, my creator through story and through comedy and earn my place in Jannah by just doing the things that I love doing. And if there's Mm. a way to make sure that faith and belief is somehow imbued in the stories that I tell. So when people watch the stuff I make or read the books I write, they understand that this is a person who is a strong believer or is a struggling to believe. And if I could get that element across mm-hmm. um, in the work that I do, that's my really only um, thing that I want is for people to watch and say, you know, right. she believes and her, her, reason for living and, and creating is to serve her creator and that is really the only thing I want to get across when I make my stuff mm. and that's it that's all I really want to do and I and then I want to die <laughs> is that best case scenario <laughs> so this is the first uh, this is the first time correct me if I'm wrong that you are like acting in uh, one of your productions as the main actor is that correct yeah it wasn't even my intention to be an actor i gotta be honest with you it was my intention to always write and behind the scenes and then after little mosque um you know i wasn't able to make another show and i thought okay then i'll go into publishing and then i published my first book but then i couldn't get i couldn't get i tried to write another i, I wrote my novel but the publisher didn't want to publish it and i kind of you know i always have this talk with god like what is going on like you cut off every avenue <laughs> Right? You start something and then it ends it. And then I was like kind of really in that really dark place again, um, which I'm really prone to go to. And then I thought, OK, maybe I should just do stand up because like maybe that's the way to reopen my career. And I thought, you know, that's typically how people really start their shows. I kind of went kind of backwards into Little Mosque and I go, why don't we do it the way you're supposed to do it? And you're supposed to make a television show after you've done stand up for several years, really mastered the skill, gotten the attention you have earned and deserved. And then I'll make a show because then people won't be so mean to me. So then, so then I thought, okay, so I started stand up. So I was doing it for six months in Saskatchewan, which as you know, is not exactly the central you know, place to do stand up. But I was hoping to eventually get recognized and make it, you know, like Rami in LA and blah, blah, blah. Um, like, you know, Jerry Seinfeld. And you know, I thought that's the trajectory. So follow that trajectory. And then the pandemic hit at, at six months. And just yeah. ended, ended the stand up. And I was like, oh, now what do I do? And in Canada, we have these um, grant. We have these opportunities to make TV by filling out grant applications. I swear 90 percent of television making in Canada is just filling out application forms. And there was this opportunity to make a trailer. And so you make a trailer for a show that doesn't exist. And the idea is that. If you could do it, if you can pull together a team and if you can get enough hits on social media, um, you become eligible to apply for a, a much larger grant. 
to help make this uh, first season. And so, you know, literally there was 48 hours left and I asked a friend of mine, Clara Ross Dunn, who was a writer on Little Moscow, can you help me? Because she's not only a great writer, but also a great application organizer person. <laughs> so she helped me because these, these things are so hard to apply for. And we got it. So we made the trailer and then we started putting together the put to, putting together the team for the actual show. And we got the money together. And and then we shot um, from October, I think it was October 12th was our first day till October 29th. It was a 14-day shoot. I can't remember the exact starting day, but it was 14 days. We just finished. And now we're going into post. And the idea is it's a proof of concept for a half hour. And so that's how I ended up starring in it. So, I mean, it wasn't my intention to even star in anything for years. But again, you know, like things just happen for a reason. The COVID gave you a jump start. Yeah, I jump started my, and I didn't think I'd ever find my way back into TV again. Like it was, it's been a long wow. circuitous journey. But you know what? When I look back at it, like it gave me a chance to be home. The publishing gave me a chance to be home and raise my children to adulthood who are, as you, as I mentioned, really traumatized <laughs> By my loss. <laughs> and because psychologically I'm this person, because of the way my father raised me, like I can't stop working and I tend to be exceedingly ambitious and it affects me psychologically. Mm. So it was good that I had the book, that I worked on two books. Working on those two books allowed me to be home, still hone my comedy skills. I never stopped writing or working in comedy. And they got a chance to grow up with a mom who is somewhat focused on them, right? <laughs> and they're now in their 20s and they've like, you know, they're all, I only have one at home right now. Um, and they're fine. Like they, I think, I don't know if they would even have been able to remain Muslim. And like, I mean, even though I'm like, I have this strong connection to Islam, I think to pass that connection on to children, you have to be hands-on and talking to them and guiding them and and it was like two hands on deck with my husband. And I think they needed that because I had been gone for so long. And that allowed them to have a mom who was like focused on them for a while. Um, and now, you know, they're good, they're independent and it's time to make another show. And I feel like I can now devote like that time and energy to it a hundred percent without it affecting anyone else's life other than my husband. But he's a pretty easygoing guy. Right. And so I'm back and I'm hoping, I don't know what God's plan is. The, the, the prayer I always make is give me what's best for me in the best way possible and mm. to open the right door um, and yeah. to close the wrong door and to give me people that are, be, you know, that will help me. And so I learned, and I know that, you know, that verse in the Quran, which is like, I will test you. I will test you with hardship. You know, I will test you with loss. And I, and that scares me the most, but I know that the purpose of life really is to be tested and not to, um, not to be over, not to be overcome by them and to be patient because within that same verse, it says, and help is always there during the test and afterwards. And to recognize that and not to be overcome with despair. Cause I tend to be overcome by the tests and, and, and start to become, you know, like I can't do this. And it's like, you wouldn't be given this if you couldn't do it and that you will have support by those around you, but you have to also recognize that support and acknowledge that support when it comes. Because I feel like this is a weird thing psychologically as human beings, we pray for something, but when that prayer is answered, we forget that it was answered and we're on to the next one. And we have to stop and say, you know, I prayed for that. And then here was the answer directly for that. Acknowledge that it got answered in the way that you had asked for it. And to stop and, and think about that and, and realize that your prayers are actually all being answered and everything is fine. And, and to never lose the purpose of your existence and, and the purpose of your intentions, that you're doing it to serve your creator and to make it to the finishing line, right? To the final relief, you know, hopefully coming. <laughs> right? so, sorry, I have a very cryptic sense of life, right? I do. Okay. <laughs> a little macabre I humor, you it. know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great, and that's that's really inspiring. And I, you know, I'm sure that for your kids to be able to 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 see your story unfold, I'm sure that inspires them to have that deeper trust and that deeper faith in Allah and and, and how things work out. And I want to thank you for blessing this podcast with your with your prayer. I loved I love everything that you just said. 
Um, I'm very like I know, for example, in Rami season two, season three, especially season three is not out yet, but season two is a lot more of that spirituality. At the end of season one, there's you know he goes to Egypt and he gets a little bit of access to that spirituality. Um, and I'm very curious to know if if you're going to have a little bit of that in your own show as being part of your own journey, but like being that it's a comedy, um, if you're going to have a little bit of, of of those underlying morals in your show. And one of the reasons why I ask this is because, I'll, like, when I watched Rami, I saw a lot of my personal stories being represented. I saw a lot of my less than perfect aspects of myself and my history, and being validated that you know what you can you can do terrible things and still be a person trying to be good and ultimately getting to that right um and i feel like a lot of the people completely missed that point in all the angry think pieces of rami so i'm very curious to know um with your new show given that we're in a completely different climate we have cancel culture everyone's woke there's like it's it's you know especially for comics given what you know dave chappelle is going through like things are very very different right so what do you expect as a reaction to your show are you expecting any reaction um are you worried about the muslims coming for you or the non-muslims coming for you or like you know just given the landscape of all the other shows that are out there what are your feelings um before essentially before this gets released about the response you will it's get? interesting right i mean the response for little mosque was very harsh from the mosque going Muslim community that I live in, very, very harsh. Like they were upset and angry and I had to resign um, as a member of Good Standing and kind of had to, I had to withdraw for a while just to try to get perspective. Um, and, you know, and, and, and what I kind of see now in, retro, in retrospect is that it was the very first show that ever came out about Muslims and mm-hmm. no one knew what to expect. People were worried about backlash. Um, there also was a level of unsophistication about understanding how media works because Muslims are under this impression that every show about Muslims has to be about the perfect God-fearing Muslim and somehow that will translate into people loving them. Right. And it's just not true, right? People want to see real people having real problems so they can relate to them. And I think gradually the show run, won over Muslims when they saw their non-Muslim friends talk to them about it and tell them how much they related to the characters mm. and how those characters were the same characters in their own community. And when Muslims saw that nothing catastrophic was happening in their lives, in fact, the opposite was happening and that Muslims were bonding with them through the show, they calmed down. And I think they came around by third season. And now, of course, everyone's like, oh, you know, why can't Rami be about Little Mosque? And I was like, oh, my God, that's so funny. <laughs> it's the same people that are ready to crucify me that have now moved on to him <clears throat> and then move on to lady parts or move on to, you know, like they just like move on to like, mm-hmm. but the thing is, I think that the, that, that what is you have to be a moving target. Like with Little Mosque, luckily they would be so enraged by the first episode, but then suddenly they'd like the second episode because it was a little different. Then there'd be a third episode that they'd find funny. Then be like, they're, like it got to like, you know, 20 episodes. Everyone would have something that they liked, something they didn't like. Non-Muslims would like this one, Muslims like this one, different types of Muslims. Would like, you know, so then it became like this big thing where you had 91 episodes. So no one could really focus their rage <laughs> anymore like they could because it was just too varied and I think the same thing is happening with Rami is that each season is different and he's exploring a different aspect of his life Mm -hmm. and so I feel that now we have sort of you know gender fluid Muslim and we're getting much more nuanced portrayals of the Muslim experience and their and and so for Muslim so I mean even Muslims themselves are the the ones who complain are like maybe this sliver of Muslims that complain or this sliver of Muslims the ones that are mm-hmm. loudest and 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 get the most attention and I feel that they are becoming more sophisticated as the generations change because there because a lot of parents said I don't understand your show but my child laughs and just please tell me not disrespecting Islam but the thing is Islam is doesn't need a sitcoms to bring it up or bring it down. It, it survives on its own. And we are beyond, Islam is beyond its depiction on shows. I mean, these are for us as human beings because we're fallible. So I know, I don't know what people's reactions will this be. I mean, I've had some people say, well, we like Little Moss. We don't like her second show. Like, she, like this, we don't like this because she's, you know, it's to this, it's to that. And for me, what I learned is that you just have to put on your blinkers and you just make the best show that you make for yourself as your own audience and mm. keep the quality and level of it high and not worry about criticism because the moment you start doing that and start satisfying this person, that person, then you dilute your vision 
and you don't make a show that satisfies anyone. So for me, I don't really, mm. like I'm not going to be, I, I know people will be upset and angry. I've gone, I've got nothing could be as bad as Little Mosque. I've gone through it. Um, I just say, if you don't like my show, watch Rami. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna love that. <laughs> here's a show for you. Oh, clearly, this is more good. So I was like, hey, or watch Lady Parts, or watch sort of. Or here's another show. Watch all, all these shows. Yeah. That, that, there's something for everyone. And if you don't like it, then you know, take some writing <laughs> courses and learn how to make television, make your own show. But I'm not here to satisfy you. Um, I'm I'm here to satisfy God and myself. End of story. <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. That's amazing. And that's sort of like, you know, that that foundation helps you stick to expressing your truth, whatever that is, instead of trying to fill whatever narratives are out there. So I, ha- I have one final question, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm getting too philosophical, but just really just just speak from your mind and heart. We're not, you're not, not expecting any deep uh, thesis here, but this one's about truth uh, and it's about narrative. Um, you know, 9-11, even a little bit before 9 9 11, um, with, the, with the Black Panthers and Malcolm X. Since then, Muslims were depicted as violent, right? So you had the angry Black Muslims, and then you had the terrorist cave dwelling Muslims. And, and so there's all these narratives. And then you had sort of as a response, the good Muslim model minority. There's all these different narratives, right? Uh, I feel personally that will succeed once the narrative that's out there is something that Muslims can relate to. And no Muslim can relate to, like a very, very small minority of Muslims can relate to seeing depictions of terrorists, right? Um, and, and, and and identifying with that, or even seeing the good Muslim um, sort of archetype. So my question to you as a creator, as someone who's been much less successful at creating and, 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 and grabbing the audience's attention, what does it take to build the Muslim narrative? I think it takes more than just, I feel, for me, it's twofold. I live in Saskatchewan. We have a 16% indigenous population. I think in the U.S., what's the term? We We use First Nations. Yes, indigenous, Native American. Yeah, Native American. So we use indigenous and First Nations. So for me, it's twofold. Um, I have a responsibility as a Muslim who lives here in Saskatchewan to the people um, that live closest to me. And Mm -hmm. as a filmmaker, it's not just what I, what I'm putting on air, but it's the people who I hire and give opportunity, economic opportunity to. And in Canada, we have what we call economic reconciliation, which means I'm a settler. I'm, you know, who, who belong in a land that belonged to first nations people whose rights were taken away from them. Now it's my responsibility Mm -hmm. to do what I can to rectify that. And so I'm making television, but that means I'm also in a position of economic privilege. And so what am I going to do as a Muslim in terms of rectifying that on screen and behind the screen? So I built into the show, um, a best friend who's indigenous so I can be able to hire indigenous writers and actors. I built into my show uh, a mentorship program for directors so I can hire indigenous directors who get mentored, who not just shadowing, because I don't believe in shadowing. I believe in you get hired to do the job so you can get credit and full pay according to the union rates. Mm-hmm. And I hire mentors to look after my directors to make sure they are given the support they need. So to me, it's twofold, right? So I can do two things at once, which is, do the art that I want to do, represent my truth and my experience, but be but be part of empowering the people who help me make the shows that I do. Because I'm not do I'm not a, a alone. It's it creates a village, an army, <laughs> to make this show with me, and that army mm-hmm. it should be just and equitable, and it should be giving opportunities to people who have had injustice done to them. Mm. And that to me in Saskatchewan is the indigenous community. So I have built in the power model is that I get actors and writers and directors from that community who will be supported and paid the same rates as everybody else. And that we are creating economic um, reconciliation by being very sensitive to those issues. So to me, it's an issue of justice. 
just because I have this power mm-hmm. doesn't mean I just use it to enrich myself and improve my brand. It's I have this power and this responsibility and privilege to make sure that people around me are also empowered and privileged and economically advantaged mm. and be given an opportunity to create their own shows and support their families and to go on, you know, because they helped me. Now I must pay back, pay that forward. I mean, it's a two prong right. approach. And that's what I'm hoping to do by making it hopefully, inshallah, this time in Saskatchewan. Right? <laughs> so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's that's what I want to do from my art. It, is it, it, My art is to only serve God. My intention is to only serve God. And that means serving God through whatever power that I have invested is to take it forward right. and to make sure that I do not... Um, use it to just empower myself and to enrich myself, but to use it and to make sure it's spread out as wide and as far as possible. And so that I feel is a responsibility and that that is what I am trying to do. And I, Alhamdulillah, was able to do that with, you know, it was a short form series, but I was able to bring in a Muslim woman to direct the first one, Iman Zahwari, who did Americanish. Candy Fox was a local indigenous filmmaker that was looking for experience and narrative and she directed episodes three and four and i was able to bring you know interestingly enough (coughs) white male directors who aren't as employable as they used to be who have so much you know decades of experience who are willing to come and help um and be mentors for women uh particularly bipoc women and so that's what i made Mm -hmm. Like part of my ethos is that I have to do that and look out for the people around me and give them the support that they need. Mm, Especially you came up in a time where you were the only Muslim woman in a room full of white men. And now you're flipping the script. Now you are in full control of this, of your show. And now you are trying to uh, bring in as many people as possible and help them out. So that that's very great and very uh, admirable of you to do that. So congratulations. Um, so before you, before we end the uh, podcast, uh, two questions for me uh, really quick. One is, um, please let us know um, where people can watch your new show. And then if you, if you have uh, your books, you can, you know, plug, plug the names of your books and where people can purchase them. And then the other question I have is, what are your adult kids interested in? What fields are they doing? Did they end up going into science and medicine or did doctors. they kind of All go into the arts? What, what, what happened there? Um, okay, so answer your questions in sequence. So the show will come out on CBC Gem in May. Um, it will right now just be available to Canadians. So Boo. <laughs> Inshallah, we'll Inshallah, be able to sell Inshallah. it to another distributor. So that's right now. Um, the next book is coming out in Canada in March. Um, it is called, well, okay, it was about, it's a satire about a Muslim woman who joins an ISIS-like group and brings it down through incompetence. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously we couldn't call it ISIS, so I call them the Dominion of the Islamic Caliphate and Kingdoms. So the book's original title was The Rise and Fall of Dick. (laughs) Oh, wow. However, the publisher had a lot of... Yeah, the publisher kept saying when we Google that, we're just getting (laughs) too many images that are not working for us. So we changed... So I had to change the title of the book. So it's called Jamila Green Ruins Everything. (laughs) A lot more (laughs) Googleable. That will be coming out in March. Um, inshallah and in the US in May so two so two two launch dates so you guys will see it in May as for my kids they all decided not to go into the arts because they saw me suffer too much mm. <laughs> <laughs> and decided they wanted regular careers with a regular paycheck they didn't choose medicine um, one cho- the eldest is doing her PhD in Islamic and First Nations oh, ethics wow. the intersection between the two these number two is doing um physiotherapy she's in she's studying right now number three is doing social work number four is doing engineering and wants to become a farmer and work in the ag tech industry because mm-hmm. we live in saskatchewan the bread basket, the bread mm-hmm. basket of the country and he wants to help feed the world so yeah good good kids alhamdulillah they survived their mom 
and they're good children, strong believers. Hopefully good they children. will stay that way. And I just pray. So I just want everyone to pray for me. I need it. Very good. We'll, we'll pray for you. Don't worry. We'll pray for us too. Mm. Inshallah. Everybody will be successful. Thank you very much again. Uh, Abbas, you got any, any last questions? Um, no, I just want to close with a prayer and I pray that Allah accepts all the actions that you are doing for his sake and that he provides you, you know, all the doors that need to be open and closes all the doors that are a distraction that you don't need open. You know, I love that. I just, you know, I need, I need to get, I'm going to get your quote and just put it up on the wall there. Um, but I, th I really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I work a lot with artists and there's always this sort of like push and pull between, oh, will my art make it to the market versus am I being true to myself? And, you know, you've been through the ringer. I think your story is really inspiring. So, you know, I'm excited to, to work on editing this and, um, and, and, and getting your story out there so that whoever hears it, if they're just like one step away from giving up on their dreams, hopefully they can hear your story and, and and just and just do it and just go for it like you did so thank you you've left me inspired and inshallah and many others thank, thank well. you very much thank you very much Zarka. you're welcome thanks so much for tuning in to the artistic foodies before we go show some love for your favorite podcast by leaving us a review on apple Podcasts. be sure to find us on facebook and instagram to stay tuned for more episodes as well as bonus content you can have access to all our episodes at theartisticfoodies.com. This podcast has been brought to you by Halal Fest Incorporated and Gamma, gathering all Muslim artists. 